Hallelujah. Yes. Bless the name of our God. Come on, just let's lift up your hands and give God praise. Isn't he worthy this morning? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I just need the Lord. I need the old I need
the blood still works. Hallelujah. Yes. In the same way that the blood works for you and I, those that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Hallelujah. Jesus said this time that the Son of Man be lifted up for all the world to see. Because they deserve the same love that we receive from our Father. They deserve the same forgiveness that we receive from our Father. They deserve the same deliverance that we receive from our Father. He said if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name. He's worthy of the praise.
Hallelujah. Come on and give him praise. Hallelujah. Give him worship. Give him adoration. Ah, glory, glory, glory. We come to bless him this morning. We come to praise and magnify him this morning. We've come to worship and adore him. We've come to make his praise glorious in this, his sanctuary. Hallelujah. Moses said, or the, the writer says that Moses, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, he says, I will draw all men unto me. So we come this morning to lift him up. Lift him up. Lift him up. Praise him. Honor him. Give him what's due him. For he is our everything this morning we've come to bless the king of kings we come to bless the lord of lords hallelujah today is communion sunday hallelujah and he said as often as you do this you do show forth the lord's death until he come there's something about the blood of jesus hallelujah the bible lets us know that there's power in the blood there's healing in the blood. Salvation is in the blood. Sanctification is in the blood. Redemption is in the blood. Reconciliation is in the blood. The Bible says that there's life in the blood. And that life is not your life, it's not my life, but it's the life of Christ. Paul says, the life that I now live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. My life is hid with Christ in God. And so this morning, we have new life. Despite where you've been, despite what you've been through, despite the challenges, despite the difficulties, despite the things that you did before Christ, the Bible says that our black sin was dipped in red blood and we came out white as snow. So this morning, we owe him praise. We owe him worship. We owe him adoration. We owe him the hand clap. We owe him hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, great King, great Savior, great Redeemer. We come to bless you this morning, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Truly, a great day to be alive despite all that's happening in the earth when we look to the Word of God the Bible lets us know that these things are going to happen in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars nation against nation famines pestilence earthquakes in diverse places all these things are the signs of the beginning of the end of the age but he says hold on for the end is not yet and they that endure to the end they shall be saved do I have any endurers here this morning anybody holding on to see what the end's going to be anybody looking forward to that day when he cracks the sky hallelujah hallelujah so we want to take this time this morning to welcome each and every one of you here to service this morning. For those of you that are here with us live in the sanctuary, we welcome you. And for those of you joining us via live stream, we welcome you as well. And as we always say, our doors are always open whenever you get the opportunity to come and be with us live, we welcome you. And if you are joining us for the very first time on a Sunday morning, would you kindly stand so that we may acknowledge you. Are there any first time worshipers? God bless you, brother. Anyone else joining us for the very first time this morning? Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. What's your name? Mario. Mario. Oh, you had the game named after you, right? Mario Brothers. 
or listener, we welcome you to service. And I understand that you met one of our members in the store. And she, you, you asked her about your church, her church, and here you are. Amen. God bless you. So the Lord set for you a day in advance. So continue to enjoy the worship experience and enjoy the word of God as it comes forth. Amen. God bless you and welcome. Now, they're giving you a first-time visitor's welcome package. That's our gift from us to you to say thank you for worshiping with us. We ask that you complete the information card and turn it into one of the offices. Amen. All right, Mario, enjoy your service. Amen. You never know what God is doing. God has us always on assignment. I love what the truth says. He says, we're on duty. We're on the same old blocks. We're different, but look the same, like plain clothes cops. Ah, that's some good stuff right there. A to the men and to the women. All right. <laughs> Y'all know I don't have a bit of sense, but let's get to the word this morning. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to read our uh, memori memory scripture, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Mm. It's just a sweet spirit in this house this morning. Help me, Lord. Ephesians chapter 2. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and coming to minister the word of God is none other than our pastor, Bishop Eric Lambert. Please receive him as he comes to minister the word of God. Father, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and minds to conceive what glorious truths there are in your holy word. Help us to rest in the fact that we are called to be holy, that we're called to be separate, your children, honoring you in our everyday life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 for remembrance. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So there again is the command, thank you, the command to be holy. Now, we wrestle with it because we look at it from a more Western concept than a biblical concept. So anything that is, is, is connected to the Spirit of God, how God moves, when we lack the wisdom to apply it, we come up with an earthly illustration or some natural way to make it uh, have have reality for us. So when we were confronted with the Bible's teachings on holiness, 
because we couldn't quite grasp the true meaning of holiness, we came up with a lot of other things. Don't wear this, don't go here, don't go there, all of those things. And one of the greatest uh, illustrations of that is uh, th for so many years, uh, women not wearing pants. It was justified out of a misappropriation of Deuteronomy 22.5. Back then, the Bible was just taken at face value without any research as to why certain things were said. So it became the bedrock for salvation and holiness. If you were a holy woman, you did not wear pants based upon Deuteronomy 22.5. The problem with that theology was nobody was wearing pants. So how could Moses identify pants when nobody wore them? Women were, so uh, a more realistic understanding uh, when you study the word of God, you have to look at it through the eyes of the writer and not the eyes of the reader because the reader is reading it in this, this, this uh, postmodern, neo-modern world and our definitions are different. The, the way we view things is totally different from the way the writer wrote them. Uh, Pauline theology doesn't seem to be as spacey spiritually as we try to make it because Paul is addressing problems that the Christians confronted in that day with the hope. Now, Paul had no idea that a Bible would be written. So he's not writing it saying, okay, this is going to be the fourth book of the New Testament or the 15th book. He, he's not writing it in that, in that mindset. He's writing it based on the needs that come to him at that moment. So that's why you find each of the letters written by Paul address various issues. In Corinth, we had a problem with uh, over-giftedness. People had gifts, and they were using gifts without wisdom and without love. So he addresses it for that particular group. Now, that does not mean that the principles that Paul gave to each church uh, are not valid for us today because they are. We are a gifted church. In the, I'm talking about the entire body of Christ. We're gifted, but we must walk in love or else the gift means nothing. The problem with the Galatian churches, uh, they were misguided. They, they were no longer operating by the Spirit. They were operating in flesh. Same principle for us. So what we need to do is understand what is God saying when certain things are written. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 22.5 uh, when the Scripture says, A woman shall not wear that which pertaineth un unto a man. We seldom look at the Hebraic meaning of the text. In the Hebraic meaning of the text, if you read it from the Hebraic meaning, you will discover that what Moses was writing, uh, the, the mindset that was coming out, uh, was a woman shall not put on men's armor and go out into battle, nor should a man put on woman's armor and go out into battle. The, the, the entire 22nd chapter of Deuteronomy really had to do with a crossing of the responsibilities of the sexes. So when you put on what belongs to a man, I need a wall. <laughs> it means that you take his authority. Now, Satan's job is to undermine the word of God and put you, the woman, in a position that God never ordained you to be in. Amen. It was never the plan of God for the woman to be head of the family. Amen. It was never the plan of God. Things happened where you became the head of the family but you are not gifted for it. You need grace. 
because you're not gifted for it. Now, uh, the government helped destroy the concept of God uh, back in the 60s when they began to pay women more when there was no man in the house. So it just makes economic sense to throw him out. I get more money. So now what you're seeing is a proliferation of women taking leadership roles and men are sitting back saying, well, they're going to do it. Now, it violates the plan of God. This is not to say that women cannot be used in ministry. That is not what, what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that there is an order to the things of God. Paul himself says that the woman was made for the man. Now, we have a problem with that in the West because of how our culture has carved out your place. So someone says, well, why are there so many women uh, uh, leading and doing in church? Because there's so many women leading and doing in the world. And the church is a representation of the structure of the world until the world breaks the pattern. And the world can't break the pattern. So we have to break it. See, being holy, again, has nothing to do with your clothes. It has everything to do with your attitude. That's what we're going to investigate again today. Say, I'm holy. I'm holy. Now, ask your neighbor, what does that mean? <laughs> See, you can spend a tremendous amount of time making sure you remove nail polish and, 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 and makeup. Because if you ever notice, if you ever notice when this doctrine was, was really being pushed, uh, it was always about these external things. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't uh, uh, paint your nails. Don't put on makeup. You had to wear ceremonial clothing in every instance because I'm holy. Now, smoking and drinking have nothing to do with holiness. They're bad habits, just like eating broccoli <laughs> and cauliflower. They're bad habits. <laughs> so, so the Bible does not specifically address drinking smoking, and all those other bad habits. So what we did in our, in our promotion of holiness, we said you can't go anywhere using Psalm 1. You're not to sit in the seat of the scornful. That meant you couldn't go to the movies, okay? You couldn't go anywhere where the scornful sat. But no one ever quite exegeted how I can go to a barbershop that was owned by an unbeliever. I'm definitely sitting in the seat of the scornful, and a scorner is cutting my hair. <laughs> but that wasn't a sin. Why? Because you needed that. Well, I need to go to the beach. Well, you can't go to the beach because you're a Christian. You have no business going to the beach. Why? Because you're not supposed to wear string bikinis. Then wear a cover-up. You're not going to hell for wearing a bikini. You're not going to hell for going to the beach. You're not going to hell for going to the movies. You go to hell because you don't belong to Jesus. Now, again, the Lord and I were wrestling with this because I was telling God, and this is no reflection on you. It's just how I talk to my father. I was telling God, they're not ready for this because they're going to interpret it as me watering down the gospel and, and, and removing restraints. And the Holy Spirit dealt with me. I can always get answers for everybody else but myself. And he says, you teach the truth and the truth will make free. Because you can't, you can't serve a God that you're afraid to serve. 
There's no joy. We didn't have joy. That's why when we would have the shouting and dancing part of the service, that's why it was going on for so long, because it was the only time we could feel free. The preaching was pharisaical. The prophetic words put you down. Now, there are times when we have to have our behavior challenged, but every day, all the time, are you telling me God doesn't love me sometimes? That he doesn't have an encouraging word for me. Who wants to live with a spouse who talks about your faults all the time? You're going to want a divorce. You mean I don't do anything right? You left your toothbrush out. You didn't fold up the washcloth. You, you didn't pull back the, 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 the cover on the bed. It's supposed to be four inches. It's five inches. I'm sick of this. You didn't pull the sheet tight. You, 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 you washed the dish and left it on the drain board. I washed it. This is a team. I washed, you put up. At some point, you're going to start looking for somebody else. You drop this on the floor. You drop that on the floor. And that's what we were getting because we were holy. So you were forced to walk around and present a hypocritical life. Oh, you didn't smoke in public. Oh, you didn't drink in public. Oh, you didn't go to the movies without something covering your face. So these actions were still being carried out. And then you, be, you were forced to come to church and have uh, an altar call that brought Christians back to the altar. How many times do you have to come to the altar before you know you're saved? There's no place in the Bible where they had altar calls. It was started by Finney and the Methodist Church. They decided that the way to, to make people know that they're saved is to stand up and encourage them to come down front. It caught on, and every time after that, People would tell you if you don't have an altar call. Oh, you, you forgot to have an altar call. Jesus can save people without altar calls. Now, we'll give you an opportunity to let us know of your newfound faith so we may help you. But that doesn't mean you can't be saved if I don't give an altar call. Because in reality, the people, the most of the people who come to the altar are those who are already saved. They messed up last week. They waited till Sunday to come down to the altar because they come down, then they turn around and go back. Why? You are in the presence of God. God says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you for that sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is not a scripture for new people. That's a scripture for believers. Read the passage. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. There's nothing in that passage that says you ask the Lord to save you. Because the passage is dealing with those who are already saved. The gist of the letter, 1 John is to people in Ephesus who are born again. And if you are born again, you don't need to wait till Sunday. You are already at the altar of God, and you say, Father, I blew it. I messed up. I did this. Forgive me. Then get up and keep on trucking. Because you are not under condemnation. Listen, if you're a believer, if you're a believer, you seldom come under conviction because you know right from wrong. Holy Spirit doesn't have to convict you. You can't cuss somebody out and say, well, hmm, good. my conscience ain't bothering me. Then your conscience is seared. Because the, let, let, let me go on here. Oh, Jesus, help me. This is my third sermon in as many days. So I'm fired up. Boy, the 11 o'clock people, they're going to really catch it. I had a little bit of rest between yesterday and the day. But, but the next group, oh, they're going to catch it. They're going to catch it. They're going to catch it. They're going to be people. Listen, the folk getting saved at midday. <laughs> so, so the Bible says, I'm called to be what? Now, how do you apply that? Well, if you, if you read over uh, in, in the Ephesians chapter 4, 
Chapter 4 begins what you should do with the holiness of chapter 1. It's got nothing to do with your clothing. Clothing is a matter of personal choice. People say to me all the time, they say, oh, Pastor Lambert, why are you still, you and Pastor Lupton, y'all the only ones still wearing ties and suits when you preach. Everybody else, you know, dressing down. They say, why you don't dress down? I said, because I'm lifted up. I'm representing the king of kings. I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to represent him with jeans with holes in it and, and T-shirts that say, you know, uh, catchy say, uh, phrases. He gave me his best. I'm giving him mine. And because I look better like this, I don't look good dressed down. Y'all lost your sense of humor. I, I'm going to become a, 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 an Episcopal minister. So listen to what Paul says here. He says, I therefore, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 1, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. I beg of you. Whenever you see the word beseech in the King James, it's really from a, it's a derivative of the word paracletus. And what he's saying is I call you aside. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a first century phrase uh, sort of along the line of uh, us telling a person uh, you, you want their attention. You, you, you want to pull them from everything else. We would use terms like, just listen to me. Come here, let me talk to you. Let me speak to you for a moment. You're saying, I want your attention. So when Paul says, I beseech you. Now, how important is this? Because you only find him saying it a few times. And usually when he prefaces uh, the statement, I beseech you, you, when you see what follows, it's very important. In Romans 12, he does that. So it's only a few times. Paul doesn't overwork uh, important things. And so here he says, I beseech you that you would walk worthy. And he uses the term vocation. And vocation is career, job, you know, calling. Uh, uh, so, so he says, I want you to walk worthy of what I told you in chapter 1. Yeah. I want you to walk worthy of your holiness. Again, it has nothing to do with the external. However, the external will reflect the internal. When Paul addresses our external, he says, you should dress modestly. What does that mean? You don't call attention to yourself. See, if you are a woman of God, you're a queen of God, right? You're a queen of God. If you're under 12, you're a princess of God. So you're a queen of God. And he's saying you should dress as befitting a queen. Now, how many of you ever saw Queen Elizabeth on any type of television issue? You ever notice how she dressed? She dressed like a queen. She wasn't out there with, you know, glittering clothes and stuff that calls attention to her because she would walk and maintain her dignity as a queen. If you're a king, same truth. You don't, you don't wear things that are immodest. And immodest doesn't always mean things that promote lust. It can also mean things that are contrary to your character and nature. Do I need to bring out my earrings again? <laughs> to drive home the point. When I clipped those earrings on, I heard a collective... <gasps> Because you knew what? They did not fit. They were contrary to my character. So as a child of God, you must discover what your character should represent to the world. Now, this is where the concept of picking up your cross comes in. I can't do everything I want to do in public because it affects those who are not yet in the family. So Paul says, I should not be a stumbling block to somebody else. So if you're a woman of God, you cannot dress in a fashion that's a stumbling block to a man that's not saved. See, a Christian man won't oogle you. Because Jesus said, if you do that, you've already committed adultery in your heart. But you, the woman, you should not dress in a fashion that highlights your gifted areas. 
because God gifts people differently. I mean, he's God, okay? But you have to hide some things. You, 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 have to, you, you can't wear it as tight and as revealing as the world because you're a child of God, and you don't want to make anybody stumble. You follow me? Why? Because I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm different. This was the illustration God gave me last week. <clears throat> I didn't do it because my poor glass told me, he says, I'm tired of you picking on me. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, you got no sense about it anyway because you have no mind. And so what God showed me, he says, so tell the people and show the people this. He says, if they bring this glass out, and apparently what do you assume when they bring this glass to me with water? No. What'd you say? The glass is clean. You assume it's clean because they brought it to me. So it's a clean glass. Now, what if the, I get one of the glasses from them and I take it out in the, the, the lot back here and I roll it in the dirt? What would you call that glass then? A dirty glass. But you would still call it a glass. Because it's dirty, it hasn't changed what it is. So when you sin, you haven't lost your Christianity. You're just a sinning Christian. If you smoke, you're just a smoking Christian. You're a drinking Christian. You follow me? Well, if you are genuinely born again, the name Christ is a sign to you. And that's the whole point behind the judgment seat. If you're willing to pay the price for your decision then do it. But you will pay. But you're still a Christian. See, we were taught for so many years that you backslide and lose your salvation. It is not possible to lose it because God said nobody can pluck you out of his hand. Not even you. Listen to me very carefully. It is best for you not to come to the altar and fake salvation than come to the altar, receive Christ, and then live contrary. Because there are levels of judgment up to and including early death. So the whole point is, uh, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Now, there are physical consequences as well as spiritual consequences. The physical consequences could be sickness, disease, death, you know, early death, uh, all types of things going on in your body, losing the blessings and the favor that you once had. All of those things could happen physically. The spiritual consequences are, would be an increase of satanic activity that you've allowed him to have because you lowered your standard of life. Peter denied the Lord. Peter denied the Lord, but he came back. That's right. David fell with Bathsheba, but he came back. He paid a horrible price. The baby died. See, he paid a horrible price. And his, his line now became so tainted that when Solomon was born, because the sins of the father carried down to the third and fourth generation, when Solomon was born, he had such a messed up life. Although he was gifted, his children were the ones who caused the break of the people of God, the people of Israel, and caused it to have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. So there are consequences to your sinful patterns of behavior that smoking and drinking have nothing to do with. Now, again, I'm not advocating it. I don't smoke and drink simply because I never have. It was not a religious reason. I just saw other people getting drunk, and I didn't want that. I just never had a taste for it. Now, if God were to say that bacon sends you to hell, I guess I'm going. I don't know any way out of it. There is no salvation from bacon. I'm sorry. Pray my strength in the Lord. But he didn't say that, praise God. Now, I know you Muslim people are saying, well, he said don't eat pork. I don't. I eat bacon. <laughs> Low salt.
You Muslim believers out there going, see, he ain't supposed to eat that swine. I don't know what swine is. I never saw a swine. I saw pigs. <laughs> he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. And how should you walk? Now notice what Paul does when he addresses the holy behavior. He says, you should live with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. And forbearing means putting up. Put up with people if you're genuinely holy. He says, endeavor, work hard. And there's an I-N-G on the verb that means you keep doing it. You don't give up. You don't just say, well, I tried. The phrase should be, I'm trying. Why? I'm holy. I'm different. My behavior identifies my holiness. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's a powerful phrase there. I am working to keep us unified, and I'm doing it by peace. So stop arguing with people. If you're holy, you shouldn't be arguing with people. Nobody likes me. Get over it. Why you tell everybody nobody likes you? Why why you do it? Because you're trying to manipulate the people to be on your side. And all you're really doing is making them not like you. Because nobody likes a whiner. Pastor, I was in church the other day, and and the people talked about me. So what? Get over it. If they're going to talk. I was on a bus with my mom one day, bless her heart, and we were on the 33 bus going downtown. And and, and mama, I sat next to mama. She was on the inside, and I sat on the outside. And, and there was a lady sitting across from us, and she was like, we were, say we were on the fourth row seat, and the lady was in the third row seat. So I'm sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm young, you know, and, and uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm going to protect mama, and mama's sitting inside, and, and the lady's looking back and looking back, and all of a sudden, I hear my mother say, boo! <laughs> and I said, why do you do that? She said, she's looking at us like she saw a ghost. So people talk about you, give them something to talk about. Walk upright, live godly, carry yourself with dignity. Let the things that they say be Christ honoring. Boy, I never met anybody as joyful as you. Praise God. Never saw anybody with such a good attitude as you. Why do they have to say things like, you get on my nerves, you frustrate me. No, listen to Paul. You work to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, comma. There's no comma there. I'm putting a comma. See, though, when the Bible says don't add to the book of the prophecy, he's specifically talking about Revelation. So I can add to the other book. So here it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, comma, and stop causing division. Don't try to put one group against another. Why? You're holy. See, again, it's got nothing to do with clothes, smoking, and drinking. It has to do with attitude. You can be the purest person with those patterns of behavior and go around cause division. You can go whisper in Deacon Doug's ear, you know, and start telling him stuff and, and try to hurt him, and you're going to talk about Brother Eric. And yet you up here shouting, dancing, speaking in tongues. So now he's angry with Brother Eric, and Eric has not said anything to him. But you did it. Now, I know it's cultural for us Hamites to backbite gossip because that's our heritage. That's what we did. We started out backbiting and gossiping against the slave masters. Then when we were freed, we had to do it to ourselves because we didn't have slave masters anymore. And we continue to talk about each other and pull each other down because now we were able to fight each other. So we, were, we got born again, and that behavior never changed. And we really don't know how to change it. So with every other major issue, we throw it on to the Lord, and the Lord can't help you with that because it's you. You don't have to speak evil of anyone. That's why Jesus said, listen, you're going to have conflicts. That's just natural. He said, but if you think your brother or sister has something against you, go to them 
and sit down and talk and say, can I buy you a cup of coffee? I need to talk with you. Sure, let's talk. You know, I feel that your attitude towards me is not Christ-like. Have I done something to offend you? It gives them the opportunity to say yes or no, but at least you can get that thing out your mind. If you don't get it out your mind, the enemy will come in, sit on your shoulder, and begin to speak negatively about the person that you assume has something against you. So now you've gone through the whole church, and you have every Everybody hating an individual because one person couldn't get along with them. They've never done anything to you. But you're holy. We have differences of opinion. That's, that's the fun of it. Pastor Doug and I, over the last few weeks, we've been sitting in my office arguing over Scripture. And I told him the other day, I said, you know how refreshing this is to argue over Scripture with somebody and they don't get their feelings hurt? He defends his point. I defend my point. There is no, like, right or wrong, so to speak. But it's like, this is how I see it. This is how I see it. It's refreshing, and it causes both of us to go back and rethink. I love that man. It's, it's great. He don't cry. He don't get, he don't get I'm leaving. He, he don't, I'm leaving the church. He's still sitting up here. Listen to the preacher. But if you notice, if you notice, he'll do, he'll do listen to the preacher real loud, but real soft. He said, even though he's wrong. <laughs> and he won't get angry because why? We walk in the bond of unity. We both understand. We have different views about things. Doesn't make me right and him wrong. This is how he sees it. And we try to meet in the middle to bless the people. You see? Satan doesn't like that. He wants you upset. Well, I believe in speaking in tongues, and I don't. Well, those of you who don't, try it. Those of you who do, stop it. See if you can make it work. Stop fighting over non-essentials. I have fellowshiped with people who do not believe in the Pentecostal expression of worship. Doesn't matter. They believe in Jesus. And as long as we walk hand in hand with Jesus, the rest of that stuff, like I used to tell him, he would say, Brother Eric, I don't believe in all the glossolalia, the tongue talk. I said, fine, that's all right. You and I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. I'll speak in tongues for both of us. Paul said, endeavor to keep the peace. We struggle and we strain at things that are not important. These people are your brothers and sisters, and whether you like it or not, you're going to heaven with them. So you need to learn how to walk in love now. Tell your neighbor, I love you. Now, if you lied, come down to the altar. Come on, get up and come down right now. Come on. So... So, so notice now, here's what Jesus does. Knowing what's going to come against us, knowing that you are called to be holy. You're not called into ministry. You're not called to ministry positions. You're called to be holy. And from that will evolve specific areas of service for the Lord that everybody cannot assume. Just like my body. My body has functions and parts and uh, different uh, groupings. See, I have a respiratory system. I have a cardiac system. I have different systems in my body. Now, my liver can't push blood through my body. That's not the purpose of it. But it doesn't sit over there and say, well, I ain't, listen, if I can't push the blood, I ain't livering. Then the brain says, hey, dummy, you filter the blood. You make it pure. You take out all of the toxins. Now the liver sticks his chest out and tells the heart, without me, you can do nothing. And all the rest of your, your, your components, they all, they all know what their place is. And the onlyest one, I love the Rugrats, the onlyest one who really is at the top of the food chain is your brain. But he never says, without me, you can do nothing because he just knows it. So if you are as gifted as you think you are, then you should just do your job. 
We don't need to call you out. We don't need to put you up front. We don't need to give you a plaque. Just do your job. My brain just, just does stuff. He's not looking for praise. He's not looking for anything. He just does what he does. And wherever God places you, just do what you do. And stop sitting around upset because you're not a leader. Of the 205 bones in your body, do you know where most of them are? Hands and feet. Most of them are in your hands and feet. Isn't that amazing? Of all the other parts of the, the skeletal system, most of your bones are in your hands and your feet. Over 19 bones in your hand. Look at that. Look what it can do. Look at that. Isn't that great? Look at that. Isn't that great? Look how it just closes up and opens up and closes it up and opens up to show you the two-spirit world. Satan, God. Satan, God. Satan, God. Give it to me. Praise the Lord. See? So when you learn to function in your gifting, in your capability, then God is glorified. That's being holy. My right hand is more holier than my left because I'm right hand dominant. See? If you're not right, you're wrong. But I'm right hand dominant. Some of you are left hand dominant. See? So your other hand is, is, is a helper. My, my right hand doesn't insult my left hand and say, you're nothing. And my left hand says, try to write. <laughs> and then I'm doing this. Then you say, the left hand comes and says, Don't, you need me to hold stuff down. We are created to need every part of us. You're created to need this entire body. You cannot function on your own. You're holy, as are the rest of us. So that means you can't stand on your own. I, 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 I do not like that phrase, God's calling me to himself. I don't like that phrase. I really don't. Because that can lift up in your mind an attitude of spiritual superiority. God's calling me to the body. And in that context, he and I spend moments alone, but my goal is to be a blessing, not to be blessed. It's to be a blessing. My goal is to be a blessing to those around me. So Jesus says over in Matthew's gospel, after he deals with the devil in chapter 4 and puts him in his place, he says, all right, now I'm going to start teaching you fundamental principles of the kingdom of God so that you may know how you should live in this world. Listen to me very carefully. You that are believers, who is born again here today? All right, now, if you didn't wave your hand, you either just, you know, an obstinate Bethelite, or you just really are not born again, okay? So if you are born again, you are a citizen of two kingdoms. When I went to Jamaica... Uh, I had my passport, and the lady at the desk there, when I got off the airplane, uh, she asked me when I gave her my passport, she said, what brings you to Jamaica? I said, I'm visiting family. She said, you're visiting family? I said, yes. I said, my dad was born here, so I'm a Jamaican. And she says, no, that's a real thing. She says, she says, oh, then you are a citizen of this country as well as your own. I said, wow. She said, you're a citizen by birth of your father and a citizen by birth in the United States. I thought, wow, that kind of makes you feel good. You know, it, 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 it does something to you to know that you can function. I went to a service uh, just not, not too far from here. It was on the campus of Arcadia College and they had invited me to speak. And the pastor of the church uh, was a fellow West Indian and he uh, called a whole bunch of them, the smaller churches together. So I'm, I'm driving up there not knowing what to expect, 
And when I went into the, the hall where they were having the service, I immediately began to weep because I was overcome by DNA. I was around my people. And I never felt that like that before. I was a, I'm a citizen of that country by my father's birth. I'm a citizen of this country by natural birth. I was born here. See? So that gives me rights and privileges. So you, once you become born again, you are a citizen of heaven. Now, you're also a citizen of the United States. The question is, which one has superiority? Well, it's going to be United States. And the reason is because you were trained in the citizenry of being a United States person. You know the Constitution. You know the Declaration of Independence. You know your rights. But do you know the heavenly Constitution? Now, there are, there, there's something in our Constitution called the Bill of Rights, okay? <clears throat> and the Bill of Rights, uh, you all know that, okay? We're not going into a civics lesson. But do you know the heavenly Bill of Rights? They're given to you in Matthew chapter 5. So here's what Jesus is saying. That's why I call them beautiful attitudes. Because it's a, it tells you how you should be. That's why he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. When you are in this kingdom, you learn that when you're poor in spirit, you learn of your total dependency upon God. Now, here is the problem. We were taught to depend upon this government. That's why there's the initial, the initial response to problems is to call those who represent the laws of this country. Oh, they're not treating you right. Sue them. Oh, they're not doing right for you. Call, call your senator. Call your congressman. And I'm not saying that's wrong. That's your initial response to deal with things on a physical level because you are, you are subject to these physical laws. If somebody hit you, okay, it's okay. If somebody hit you, if you think they're going to hit you, okay, that's a physical law. Now, apply kingdom principles. If somebody hit you, if you think they're going to hit you, see there? See the difference? See the difference? But you are not trained in kingdom of heaven principles. You struggle with kingdom of heaven principles. You struggle. So here we'll have argument. Well, that's not what the Bible means. Jesus don't want me going around getting beat on. But what if he did? He did. Paul did. What if for the kingdom of heaven's sake, you're supposed to take a verbal beating? Look, I, that, that, that ain't going to happen, Pastor. You, should, you stretching me. You stretching me. That's okay. I used to stretch my Play-Doh, too, and my Silly Putty. You'll come back when you understand that as a holy representative. First of all, let me calm your fear. God won't let that happen to you if he knows you can't take it. If he knows you're a thug Christian, he ain't going to let nobody bother you. He don't want you to have a 187 on his watch. 187 is murder. He don't want you. So he said, the devil come and say, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm going to try so-and-so. And the Lord said, no, 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 you're not. No, you're not. They're not fully delivered. <laughs> Satan said, what do you mean? He said, you see what they got in their belt? He says, so no, you can't, you can't send anybody to do that. 
I was in a bookstore looking at news magazines one day, and, you know, I like U.S. News and World Report, Time, Newsweek. I, just, I, I was just looking through them to buy them, and a man walks up to me, and he says, he just stood there for a little while, and then after a while, he turned and looked at me and said, I ought to, I ought to punch you in the face. <laughs> now, the two natures are, are, are very much active. I'm not dead yet. I'm dead, but I ain't dead. <laughs> but I'm also a child of God and a representative of the kingdom. So I turned to him and said, I don't think today would be a good day to try that. <laughs> and he walked away. I think the enemy wanted to see if I would get into a match with him. But I wasn't going to allow myself. I said, no, today wouldn't be a good day to try that. See, the devil will try you, and God will allow it based upon his knowledge of your ability to take it. How holy are you? Are you holy enough to be tried? Are you holy enough to turn the other cheek? Are you holy enough to be wronged and let the wrong go? Yesterday, the Lord and I were talking. I was on my way to preach uh, at a church, and, and as, as we're going, just out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit just, just threw into my mind. I, I'm, I'm like, why, why is it that you do this? There's no rhyme or reason for this. And I'm driving, I'm riding in the car, and, and, and the Holy Spirit just throws in my mind. He says, how much will you take from me? I was hoping he would change that preposition uh, from for to from. Then I'd have an answer. If he said, how much will you take from me? I'd be like, five million. <laughs> but he said, for me. And I, I tell you the truth, saints, I got nervous. Because when God starts asking those questions, stuff's going to happen. But I'm smart now. I'm like Ezekiel. By the time Ezekiel got to the 39th chapter, when you read up in the first parts of this book, and he's trying to answer God. By the time he gets to the 39th chapter and God shows him the valley of dry bones, he said, can they live again? He said, you know. <laughs> I ain't even dealing with it. You, you, you know. And that's what I said to him. I said, you know. I'm, I'm not even dealing with it. I, I, I started putting scriptures in my mind. You won't give me more than I can bear. And I can't bear anybody in my face. So, so you ask the question, how holy am I? The degree of holiness that you experience is directly related to the, to the, the seriousness of your test. The greater the test, the more God is telling you, you are really set apart. You are really mine. And areas of deficiency he works on when you hear the word of God preached and taught to you. And then you have to be honest enough to say, God, I'm not fully dead in that area. I still become upset when someone talks about me. I don't care. So it doesn't bother me anymore. People, Pastor, people talk about you. Fine. That's great. What can they say? <laughs> so... So Jesus says, I'm going to teach you the principles of the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He starts with that. And last week we, we discussed that the poor in spirit means that you are totally dependent upon God. And this is the, 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 the beginning of your holiness. You are totally dependent upon God. Poor in spirit means that you're full of the knowledge of God. The opposite is that you're full of self. Just look at how our uh, generations have, have, have moved forward, okay? Uh, in the 50s and 60s, people were more community-oriented. That's why you would see them outside sweeping pavements, painting curbs, beautifying the neighborhoods, watching out for each other's children. You could leave your door open because your neighbor would watch it. You could leave the keys in your car with the engine running because the people would watch it. Then we got to the 70s. In the 70s, we began a little more isolation. We still had some uh, concept of community, but it began to change. It is in the 70s you find that communities have become uh, dirty. 
There was no longer, you know, we, we didn't care about uh, in the 50s and 60s from what I'm told from my older relatives. You, 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 you didn't care if the city did certain things. You would do them. We had block parties. Well, you had block parties, right? And, and, and the, the purpose of the block party uh, primarily was to clean the block and then you celebrated after cleaning the block. You all worked together, okay? Now here we are in this postmodern world, or, or as we say, neo-modern world. And the thrust now is me. You see? Back then, back then, 50s all the way up through the 60s into the 80s, it was an external mindset. Now it's me. Even, even uh, the heroes, there was a, a popular commercial that, where the little boy uh, is, is looking at Michael Jordan, and he says, I want to be like Mike. I want to be like Mike. And there was always an outside hero. But now, as we entered into the 21st century, you are being told, be what you can be. Be the best you you can be. There is no more external connection. It is a direct assault on the biblical principle of body. All of us are looking for our ministry rather than my connection. Here, listen to phrases such as, I came to get mine. I'm going to get mine. But in the body of Christ, yours is connected to mine. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Listen to Jesus. Jesus never said, never said that singularly we are blessed and successful. He said where two or more are gathered in my name, that's where I am. God says I inhabit the praises of my people. He don't say I inhabit the praise of one person. Now, although we know he does, he's trying to give us the conceptualization that I am dependent upon you. So therefore, I can't hate you. You might be the door for my breakthrough. Do you know one of the most revelatory things in the word of God is that your spouse can be the door to your spiritual breakthrough, but Satan keeps you fighting against your spouse that you can't receive from them. This is why Paul said the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a message in itself, and I can't deal with all of the nuances of it. But suffice it to say that the, in the marriage connection, you have so much authority, lady, if you're a born-again woman and your husband has yet to come to the cross, you have the authority to put the necessary pressure on him to sanctify him to the Lord so God can save him. Your lifestyle and your prayer power can stop that person from drinking. And he won't even know why. That's why uh, the devil doesn't want you to have a Christian spouse. Because he knows the power. And then on the man's side, the woman should not be beguiled because she has a spiritual man. Amen. Listen to me, you, you saved husbands. You ought to look at the programs that your wife looks at when it comes to preaching and teaching the word of God. I ain't talking about HGTV and, and Oprah and all that other stuff. That's just feminine stuff. I'm talking about you ought to know what preachers she's watching because everybody is not preaching according to the law of your house. You can't have your wife receiving knowledge from someone that's not married. Child, you need to wake up in the morning and just go on out and do what God told you to do. And you got a wife, you got a husband and, and, and kids. You just out in the street. And see, there is a strange phenomenon going on in the church right now. This has to do with holiness. Everything I'm telling you has to do with holiness. And, and there's a strange phenomenon where single people are pulling on married wives and pulling them out into activities away from their spouse because they don't have one. Now, the husband's home angry 
because you out with your single friends. Now, I'm not saying you can't have them, but they shouldn't be pulling you away. Your husband should not long for you while you run in the street with your single friends. Maybe I shouldn't have the Ask Pastor Lambert night for married couples. I, 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 I think we should change it to Ask Bishop Lambert night. I need a little Episcopal authority. So he says, the poor in spirit are those who depend upon God. Now I'm going to ask you a question. You don't need to answer it now, but you should answer it in your own mind and when you think it through at home. How dependent are you upon God? And I'm not just talking about for stuff. How dependent are you? So Jesus says, you're poor in spirit. Notice what he says. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a beautiful story. What he's saying is, when you are totally dependent upon God, heaven is your reward. You can't be dependent upon your doctrine, your gifts, your talent, your ability. You can't be dependent upon what you feel. You must be dependent upon God. And that's a lifetime experience. You will never be totally dependent upon God over the space of a few years. It's a lifetime experience. And I believe, although this is not biblically supported, it's just my own belief, I believe when you finally reach that, 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 that apex of your uh, trust in God, he's going to take you home because he don't want you to slide back. He's still working on us to bring us to that place because we're not. So how do you know, Pastor? Easy. If something happens in the world and it brings you consternation, worry, and frustration, then you're not depending upon God. You're depending on people. If someone who helps you financially, if all of a sudden they say, I'm not going to do it anymore, and you get angry, you're not depending upon God. You're depending upon them. And one of the primary commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. And yet, we find ourselves having gods before him, not even realizing we're committing idolatry because we put our confidence in them. I will vote in November. I will vote because it's my constitutional duty and my civic responsibility. That's right. But it don't matter to me who wins. That's right. That's right. Yes, I would like for my candidate to win. That's the whole point in voting. But if my candidate does not win, I'm not going to go on onto my social media platform and put down the winner. Because I have Daniel telling me the only, the only way anybody could get in office is if God allows them. And since I have Jeremiah 29 where God says, I'm not trying to hurt you. Whoever he puts in office, he didn't put them in there to hurt me. He may have put them in there for me to become disengaged from a system that is anti-Christ. Everybody was upset when Ronald Reagan became president and cut out a lot of the welfare programs. I rejoiced because too many of God's people were on welfare. Now, I understand some people need it, but a lot didn't. It is not the responsibility of the government to take care of orphans and widows. According to the word of God, it's the responsibility of the church. In fact, the first century church was so effective in their, in their application of scriptural truth, uh, uh, biblical uh, 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 revelation. Uh, Roman soldiers, they would, and the Roman government, they practiced abortion, but they, they practiced it a different way. They didn't just go after the baby in the womb. They allowed the child to be born. And if they didn't want the child, the family, the husband, the, the mother and the father, I'll say because it wasn't always a, a, a husband and wife, the, the mother and the father would take the little infant and walk it out into the wilderness and drop it off in the wilderness. And the animals will come and tear it up and kill it. Well, when Christians found out about it, they did not protest what the Romans were doing. They used to follow the families as they went out into the woods, and when they dropped off the baby, the Christians would scoop it up and take it back and raise it. 
All you've heard over the past 10 years was Christians fighting against abortion, but we weren't opening places to adopt them. We weren't trying to save the baby. We were just trying to put down the mother. See, and many of those people were not even born again. They were just social activists. There, there must be actions that come from our life if we're representing the kingdom of God. The world needs to see a distinction between their world and ours. And what is our motivation? I'm dependent upon God. Therefore, I walk in love. Let me move on now. Notice, he goes on and he says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, the word used here uh, really carries the idea of having a broken heart. Now, one would look at this on the surface and say, why would this be a beautiful attitude? Why is the Lord acknowledging and lifting a mourning attitude? Well, a careful exegesis of the passage tells us that what the Lord is saying is that if you are a person in a, with a mourning heart, you're going to be compassionate. Watch. A pastor friend of mine was preaching a sermon one time, and uh, he said he had performed so many funerals that he became callous. He had gotten to the point where because of his duties, he couldn't mourn over the loss of anyone. It was just a duty. He lost his, his, his sorrowful heart like so many of us. You hear so much about murder, so much about death, so much about crime, so much about violence, that you hear it now and just move on. He said it did not, it did not return until his sister died. When his sister died, he said then he realized what it meant to mourn again. You hear every week about somebody dying. Every week you hear a name. That name doesn't resonate with you. Frankly, you don't care. You sit and you endure it. You're not brokenhearted over it. It's just a church ritual. What do you care? Jane Doe's brother died. Are you going to call Jane Doe? Are you going to come to the funeral? Are you going to cook for Jane Doe for the next four days so she doesn't have to? What do you care? You just listen to the preacher get up and say, oh, we want to announce the death of so-and-so. Doesn't mean anything. You've heard about a lot of people dying. If I die, only five people in here are going to care. The people that are in here that share DNA with me, that's it. The rest of you will be like, oh, praise the Lord. He, at least he's with the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless him. God bless him. You'll mourn and you'll be inconsolable for about 72 hours. After that, it'll be, who's going to be pastor? Because I ain't staying. I ain't staying. If, 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 Doug, if, if he put Doug up there, I, I'm going to find me a new place. I'm going to Pastor Tim's church. There's no grief coming from us. There's no collective sigh. It's just part of the announcements. There's more of a response from you if I say we met our goal. If I were to tell you that we met our goal, if I were to tell you that we met our goal for the loading dock, there'd be more response. Yeah! But when you hear somebody die, you're like, oh, mm. wow. At least it ain't me. Better them than me. When the young criminals shot up the bus a few weeks ago, did you hug your child when they came home? Oh, that's a shame. But did you feel anything? Did you feel what God felt? Do you know God's feelings always result in action? For God so loved the world 
that he sat there and watched everybody go to hell and said, well, it's a shame. It's Adam's fault, and there's nothing I can do about it. What if that had been the attitude of God? And he would have been justified in doing it. The angels standing before him, most holy Lord, king of the universe, the people are going to hell. Well, that's what they chose. But you love them. Yep, I am love. But the, there's a comma there. For God so loved the world that he gave. What do you give when you mourn? Jesus is trying to illustrate that this attitude is an attitude of the kingdom. How can you bear one another's burdens if you don't care? Paul says to the church at Galatia, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Wait a minute. Hold it. Bear one another's burdens and as I do that, I fulfill the law of Christ, which is what? Love. Do you care? Now, this is not an indictment, nor am I fussing. I'm trying to get you to realize that what's happening in our culture has so jaded us that we really don't care. And it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's just the proliferation, the growth, the consistency of tragedy and death that you, you become immune to it. And then you feel the survivor's guilt. Well, it ain't happened to me, and you feel somewhat bad, but you don't feel bad enough to, to offer hope and help. When the, I was driving my car and I heard over KYW the young man that was killed down in the old Simon Gratz and the boys walked up and just shot this young man in the chest. I was way across town and when I heard it, I burst out in tears and I drove down to where the crime took place. I pulled my car into the area, sat there and began to weep and pray. I reached out to the family and offered if there's anything that I can do. I said, I pastor a church in Winco, and if there's anything we can do to help you, please do not hesitate to call. She said, she said I thank you, sir. I said, yes. I said, my name is, is Eric Lambert, and I pastor Bethel Deliverance International Church. She said, thank you so much. I prayed with her over the phone. Do you care? That's what God would have done. Jesus would have stopped by that house, and he would have said, oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Can I help you? And since we're supposed to be little Jesuses, if we are not mourning, what have you mourned lately? The hardness of society, the callousness of our world. You can't turn it off. You can't be callous in the world and not callous in the church. So Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. When you hear that somebody's going through a marital breakup, do you rejoice or weep? There must be a response to the results of someone else's life. Did you hear? Uh, uh, Brother John Doe's son was arrested and locked up for 10 years. Really? Oh. But inside, well, he must have been doing wrong. That's what he deserved. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. I love this. He said, because they'll be comforted. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You want to know why no one's there for you? Because you're not there for someone else. God operates in laws of reciprocity. You reap what you sow. That's why you never go to a funeral. You never support anybody. You never go out and, and, and let them know you care. And then you have a death in your family and nobody comes. And you stand around looking, well, where the church? Where the church? Where were you? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's an attitude. Do you have a mourning attitude? 
Do you care when someone else is broken and downtrodden? Do you give of yourself? You're holy. You're supposed to be a representative of the kingdom. Here's what the Lord taught me. He said, Eric, whenever God calls me, Eric, usually he says, son. When I'm doing right, he says, son. See? Um, uh, that's when I know I'm okay. But when he says, Eric, he, he's upset. And he said to me, he said, Eric, you're supposed to be my representative. When people look at you, they should see this is what God would do. I was so broken. I, I, I cried. I said, Lord, I can't do it. He said, that's right. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. Your job is to keep the vessel clean so the Spirit can do his thing. Because I separate you. Now, that's the first phase of the mourning. The second phase is the, mourn, the person who mourns is a person who becomes deeply sorry for their sin. We sin every day. Thought, word, or deed. You can't stop. Right? You lie when you don't have to lie. You cheat when you shouldn't cheat. See? You do things. It's just the normal evolution of the fleshly life. But you shouldn't be happy when you do it. You shouldn't be glad that you got away with it. Blessed are they who mourn. A secondary uh, uh, application of this tells us it's a person who has a deep sense of loss with God. You're not losing your relationship. You're losing that fellowship. As a child, I had one goal in my life as a child, and that was to be a good son to my mother and father. I wanted to make sure I never wanted them to come and see me in jail. So that's why when I hung out with my friends, and uh, we weren't always doing things that uh, would honor God, uh, I wasn't saved, okay? So we would do things, but the, the police would come from the west, I would run to the north because I did not want to, to injure my parents. I just wanted to be a good son, see? So even in school, I did not want uh, uh, behavioral problems to be communicated to my parents. I didn't want it. For one, I didn't want to hurt my mother, but number two, I didn't want my father to beat me because that's how it would work. Mama would get the note from the teacher and daddy would beat me. He, 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 he would do that, okay? That's just how it worked, see? That's why I'm in the pulpit and not a jail cell. Okay, so, 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 so when you become a Christian, you ought to have the same mindset. I don't want to hurt God. Now watch this. When you talk about a heart that mourns, Psalm 51, after David had, had, had fell with Bathsheba, okay? Now remember, what is David? He's the king, okay? He is fully king by this time. All of his anointings are over. The last anointing has been carried out, and he is fully king now, which means he's the law of the land. He can do whatever he wants. So he sins. He falls with Bathsheba. She comes to him and says, I'm late. David says, what do you mean? No, you're right on time. She said, no, I'm late. We're going to have a child. Now, I don't know if this particular song, because all psalms are songs written to be sung, okay? So I don't know when he pens this. Personally, this is where Doug and I will fight it out in a few weeks. Personally, I think... Once he was confronted by the prophet Nathan with that beautiful story about the man who comes to a person's house and, and, and he says his friends have come to visit him and he goes to his next door neighbor and takes his one little sheep and he has a whole corral full of sheep. And David was so incensed that he's, so Nathan says, what shall be done to this man? David said he should be summoned before the king and put to death. And Nathan said, you're the man. Can you imagine that? You're executing righteous judgment, but on someone else instead of yourself. Nathan says, you're the man. Then he comes back 
with this story that further breaks David's heart. He says, this is what the Lord is saying. He says, you could have had your pick of anyone in this kingdom and been justified in doing so. But why would you go take the wife of your trusted servant? Uriah wasn't some bum. Uriah was one of his mighty men who hung out with him from the cave of Adullam. That's why David could write, it wasn't my enemy that reproached me, it was my friend. David was hit with that reality and he sits down and he writes, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that thou mightest be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in, in, in sin did my mother conceive me behold you desire truth in the inward parts and the and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit and I'll teach other people and sinners will be converted because they see the brokenness in me. Blessed are they who mourn. Read this thing over and over again and you will notice these, these, these strange absences. Number one, he never blames Bathsheba. He doesn't say if she hadn't been out there naked, I would not have fallen. She had every right to bathe naked on her own patio. And she had every right to open the curtains. He should have been man enough. First of all, he had no business being at home. The army was out fighting. His place was to be in his tent out on the battlefield. When you aren't where you're supposed to be, you become susceptible to fleshly desires. Nor does he say, I couldn't help it, God. She, she, she just turned me on and I couldn't help it. No, he says, I sinned against you. He doesn't even mention that he sinned against her, which he did. He said, but I sinned against you and you only. The third absence is his request to stay king as Saul did. David does not ask God to let him maintain his kingdom. He said, just don't take your Holy Spirit. I don't care about anything else. Just don't take your Holy Spirit. I'm willing to give up the episcopacy. I'm willing to give up the pastorate and anything else. But God, just don't take your spirit from me. Because without your spirit, I can't make it. Blessed are they who mourn. But they realize that they can't make it without God. They realize that they must have an attitude that says, I'm broken. How do you feel when you sin? How do you feel when you violate the principles of God's word? And we're looking at sin from a, a pharisaical way sometimes. Oh, well, I'm not violating the Ten Commandments. I haven't uh, robbed anybody. I haven't uh, uh, murdered anybody. Really? If you're a wife, have you submitted yourself to your husband? Well, no. That's sin. Because it's a directive from the Word of God. Husband, are you loving your wife as Christ does the church? Well, you know, I, I, look, I treat her like she treats me. Really? Really? Are we serious this morning? That's why Paul said, because he knew that we would have that excuse. He said, you love her as Christ loves his church. Christ does not treat us the way we should be treated. He treats us the way he wants to be treated. 
I thought I was doing something at this stage in my Christian life. Years and years ago, I said to God, I said, God, your word says that I should treat people, you know, the golden rule is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And I was just boasting about the fact that I was doing unto others as I would have others do unto me. And the Lord said, no, that's not good enough for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're to treat others the way you want me to treat you. And there's not a one of us in here that would ever want to go to God and ask God to forgive them and hear him say, absolutely not. I can't stand you. I remember what you did last week. I'm done with you. And if you don't want God to have that attitude towards you, then why do you have it towards others? I'm done with them. I'm just done. I'm just done. Now, I'm not talking about uh, patterns of behavior that seek to pull you down. I'm talking about a clear offense. I'm not talking about somebody who just wants to use you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you should be done with those people because they'll never grow up as long as you keep doing everything for them. But I'm talking about somebody who offends you for whatever reason, and you can't release it. And again, we try to justify it. Oh, well, you know, praise the Lord. Well, you know, the Bible says you got to forgive and forget. No, it doesn't. You're adding on a- an impossibility that God never called you to have. He said forgive. He said, well, then what's forgiving? It means you don't deal with them based on the offense. Why? Because I'm holy. See? Now, wouldn't you rather I go back to clothes and smoking and drinking? Isn't it easier just to give up drinking and smoking and dressing a certain way rather than to apply the principles of holiness that God really expects us to apply? That's why nobody wanted it. We love to stand before God. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't, I don't, I don't do any of those things. But I have bitterness that I haven't written myself of. There's some people in this very congregation that I do not forgive. And when I look at them, I let them know I haven't forgiven it. Now, who you think you looking at? I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Ephesians 1, Paul says, you've been declared holy. Again, not from the external, but from the internal. I must be poor in spirit. It's an attitude of the kingdom. I must be a person who mourns. I should care when other people are hurting. Not just out of form and fashion. We want to notify you of the death of John Doe, uh, who is the husband of Jane Doe, and the father of, then we got to read everything, you know, the father of Bill. The, and, and Jane and, and, and the owner of Spot and, and you know just all through all of that now I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong I know we should know that's not my point my point is when you hear it how do you feel you hear it so much until you become anesthetized just like we did to abortion the average Christian you hear about abortion you go like, oh well that's a shame but that was the extent of it. That was the extent of it. And we would throw this philosophy at every question. What can I do? I'm only one person. One can chase a thousand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today and how you challenge us to be holy. We realize now, Lord God, how being holy is truly active participation with your character, your plan, and your will, not only for our lives, but for the world. Help us to be able representatives of who you are and your kingdom. That the kingdom does not come with observation. It comes with power. It comes with life change. It does us no good to talk about the kingdom if we're not loving people and and living like kingdom people. Help us, Father, today in the name of Jesus. Help us. 
Someone may not have given their lives to Christ as of yet. I pray for them now that you would touch them from the top of their head to the sole of their feet and bring them to a place where they can cry out, Lord, save me. If you're here and you do not know Jesus and you want to know him as your Savior and Lord, repeat this prayer with me. Lord God, forgive me for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you now as my master and my savior. God, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Make me clean today. I will serve you, give my life to you, honor you, learn about you, and walk with you in the days to come. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you're here, we have some free literature that we love to give you. The ushers are walking through the aisles. Just slip up your hand. I know you may feel embarrassed, but just kind of just wave it at them. Everybody doesn't have to know. But we want you to get started with your salvation. We have follow-up teams. We have people that are here to help you because you cannot make it on your own. Get the free literature. Get the free literature. Read through it. We're going to start giving out Bibles uh, to people, Uh, 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 primarily the book of John, Gospel according to St. John, and then I'm trying to find one that just has isolated 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John because I know a lot of people, you're, you're, you're troubled reading through this. So we're going to try to fix it so you can, you know, get little compartments to start, to build up a hunger. Then you can go to the big book. But I don't want anyone to miss the truths of the Word of God. Hear me when I tell you, it's going to get worse in the world. Not just America, but in the world. Start now building your ark. For mental stability for family connections. Listen, things that once stood are not going to stand anymore because the world gets further and further away from God. So let us put Jesus back in every place the world threw him out of. The home, the school, everything. I'm praying big time about starting a school for children where they can go from K through, through uh, ninth, or at least ninth to start, uh, and hopefully K to 12, because we need a substantive place where children can come and learn the principles of God, because they're not getting it in public school. So I need you all to pray with me. It will be a great step of faith. But I believe God. There's nothing too hard for God. We have good people here in our school. We have good people here in our church. We have people uh, that are trained, people who know how to do things, people who are legitimate teachers. We 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 have public school instructors like Pastor Wayne. He don't need to be teaching for them. He needs to be our principal. That's what we, we need people like that, filled with the Spirit. And he won't have to worry about ducking bullets. And he can walk into a class and pray for kids and cast out devils. And won't have to worry about losing his job. We need a school. And I'm laying it before God. It's in the preliminary stages now of laying it before God. So let's lay something before God because I want to make a difference. I don't want to just be in the world. I want to change the world. Amen. Amen. Together. Together. We can do this. And I know a lot of you are certified teachers. And you're out there teaching for them heathens. They don't pay you any money. You come over to the Lord. We ain't going to pay you no money either. You can't say you didn't know. <laughs> the just shall live by faith. No, we, we, would, we would beat them. That's all right. 
I just couldn't resist it because you were sitting there looking like, oh, he's going to really, no, no, no. Amen. Now, don't forget, next Sunday evening, I know it's Resurrection Day, but that's what the Lord's instructions to me, uh, they were very clear. That on the fifth Sunday of every month in 2024, we're to have a restoration of the power of God service. In those services, the atmosphere will be charged and created. It is being, it is that part of the, uh, of the service is being conducted by our prophetic team. Because they are walking around our campus, they are walking around the sanctuary, and they are releasing the Word of God, which stirs the atmosphere and creates the atmosphere for healing and deliverance. That is being done by our prophetic team. See, prophecy ain't just about coming up to a person and telling them they're going to get a new car. It is spiritual warfare. While I, like Moses, see, here, here's, here's, here's the revelation. They are the Joshua's fighting the Amalek while I'm on the mountain talking to God. Amen. Getting the infusion that I need to bring out to you. So the fifth Sunday, next Sunday in the evening at 6 p.m., we are going to have our first restoring the power of God. And I couldn't be more excited. I am excited. So plan to be with us. Plan to be with us. Uh, next Sunday and then Wednesday night this Wednesday is prayer and Bible study now what time is prayer six o'clock and what time is Bible study all right so you know so we want you to come out and be part of prayer and Bible study amen good word of God coming to you to give you your midweek filling so you can deal with that rascal the rest of the week amen and once again, I want to thank the evangelism team for coming out uh, with me when I go out to minister. You were with me Friday. You were with me Saturday. You were with me last Saturday. And I am so thankful. I will tell you this. Uh, yesterday when I was ministering at the church and I, I was feeling what I was feeling and I said, God, I said this just, I feel so strong. I feel so, 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 so capable of doing things. And he said to me, he said, the evangelism team is praying for you. And that's why it's so important for you to be there. Amen. It's so important. I could tell you some things that would frighten you that have happened to me when I used to go by myself. Satanic attacks, the loss of my sight in the car, demonic infestation in the car coming home, fighting the devil all the way up 95 from Chester. And that was when the Lord said, you are never to go by yourself again. And I couldn't have a better group of people who come out. Amen. The security, I'm telling you, I feel, I feel like the president. <laughs> they are there on point. I love those brothers. And I'm telling you, they do a great job. The, the adjutancy, the staff, I, 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 I can run faster and, 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 and do more because I have such great support. And I want to thank everyone for what they do to make it, make it possible to bring the Word of God and fulfill my apostolic assignment. See, God has given me a region and told me directly what to do with it. So we are planning another church. We are doing other things in that region. And in that role, uh, I need a lot of support. And you give it to me. And I thank you wholeheartedly. I really do. Amen. It's offering time. Yes, yes, yes. Offering time. Malachi says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat or supplies in my house and prove me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough to contain. So give your tithe and your offerings. And watch God give back to you. Stop robbing God. Stop robbing God. Give him what's his, and he'll give back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over with good measure. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So let's get ready to receive. We don't take an offering at Bethel. Because, look, you ain't going to let nobody take nothing from you. But we will receive what you give to the Lord and apply it to the ministry here at Bethel to take care of the bills and everything else. Now, I will tell you uh, 
we started at the end of January to raise $80,000 to fix the loading dock because it is in deplorable state and God has kept us so no one walks across it, falls, and becomes seriously injured. I brought it to you the last week of January. We needed $80,000. The building fund drive for the loading dock is over. Now, 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 that was your introductory clap, right? That was your introductory clap. Now I want the real clap because the final total was 88000 Now you can't tell me, Bethel, don't get behind the vision. And so the gentleman... Uh, uh, spoke to uh, Martin and the other people last week, and they're going to be starting, I think, next month, and there'll be about six to eight weeks where we won't be able to go in there at all, but they're tearing everything out, putting new steel flooring, new columns, and everything in, and it's all paid for. We didn't give it to him yet, but we have it. So we gave him his 50% to get started, but you, by your faithful giving, you have met that need, as you always do. I had no doubt that Bethel would do that. So I thank all of you, and I'm going to give you all a collective hug. God bless you, and thank God for his faithfulness. Amen. So that building fund drive is all over. Amen. And so now the Bible says we have rest. Take a little rest, see, from any large uh, uh, things. You can still give to the building fund because we use that to take care of normal maintenance and things in our building. We're going to be getting new doors at the chapel. All those doors in the front of our chapel, they're all going to be ripped out, and new steel doors are going to be put in with new steel uh, frames and everything so we don't have anybody trying to break in and steal. But we already raised those funds from before. You are just so good, and God is so good. We have that. That came to $33,000, but we have that. God already, God already provided that. But your giving, that was the only thing that was super. We did look at an elevator to go from down here upstairs, and uh, we're still negotiating with them uh, about prices and how to do it because we really want to make it convenient for people who have to go upstairs. We have beautiful bathrooms upstairs now, so if you're up there for any activity, you don't have to run downstairs, you know, uh, to relieve yourself. There's nice places up there now, and I'm telling you, God has been good to us, and you've been faithful with your giving, and the one thing about Bethel is you can always see where the money goes. Amen. And I thank you all for taking care of the carpet. They're still just as blue as they were when we bought them. We have a guy coming in now to clean our chairs. He has already cleaned some of them, and he's going to continue to work through and clean. We cleaned the worst of them, and we're going to continue to do that because even though we don't have a $25 million building, we still want to make it look nice. This is still the place where we meet God. Amen. So this is our tabernacle. Until we get our temple, this is our tabernacle. Amen. And so I thank you for your giving, for your support, for your loyalty, for your prayers, and for your love. And I pray that God blesses you as much as he can and as often as he will. Amen. So if you're ready to give, let's stand. Today is Holy Communion. It's Palm Sunday. Jesus rode into uh, the, the city of Jerusalem. They threw down palm branches and screamed, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then by Friday, they said, crucify him. That's why I don't let people praise me or lift me, because then they'll want to kill you afterwards. But we're going to give now. Father, bless our giving. Meet the needs of the church. Meet the needs of your people. And cause your people to ever be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the ushers are going to lead you out. Let's get this around in five minutes. Return to your seat to receive the Lord's Supper. God bless you.
Father, we bless you, we thank you, we honor you, we magnify your name. We dedicate this offering to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord as we prepare to partake of Holy Communion. The Bible lets us know that this ordinance was instituted in order that we might remember what the Lord has done for us. He says that each time we do this, we do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. We want to ask Pastor Norman if he would pray over that which represents his body and Prophetess Celeste, that which represents the blood. Gracious Father, we just thank you for this time of communion. Lord, we do remember the price that you paid for our salvation, a great price, the pain that you went through, the agony on the cross, and you did nothing wrong. So we honor you today. Thank you, Lord, for you said as often as we do this in remembrance of you, we remember your sacrifice, and we love you, we honor you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for everything that you did to bring us back to yourself. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Every drop from the crown on your head, piercing of your side, stripes upon your back, the nails in your hands and feet. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We thank you for every drop of blood. And we thank you for this which represents that blood. We thank you for purifying it, that it no one be harmed. May we remember all that you paid for us in Jesus' name.
has everyone been served that desires to be served? We have a couple more. Has everyone been served that desires to be served? And they all ate together. And they all drank together. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Father, for remembering the sacrifice that you did for us. We shall never forget the price that you paid for us. We thank you and bless you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please pass your cups to the aisles and the officers will come and collect them. Amen. Just before we give our benediction, we are... Sunday. We have a lot of updates to share, so please stay tuned and get informed about what's coming up soon. The Dawning of a New Day Healing and Recovery Ministry is a grief ministry that is designed to help our members heal from grief in all areas of their lives. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, severe medical diagnosis, or career loss, our recovery ministry is here to support you through it all. If you're working through any type of grief in your life, we invite you to come out to Dawning of a New Day Healing and Recovery Ministry on Friday, April 5th at 6 p.m. in the 2901 building, First Peter Room. You don't have to be alone in your journey towards healing and recovery. Attention all teachers of the Bethel Institute of Biblical Studies. There will be a special meeting on Friday, April 5th at 6.30 p.m. in the 2901 building, Adam Room. This will be a time of encouragement and preparation for the next semester with new courses and certificate programs. Please make plans to attend this important session. The Bethel School of Prophetic Development welcomes you to come and learn the function of prophetic people in the body of Christ at the first prophetic gathering of 2024. It's taking place on Saturday, April 6th at 6.30 p.m. in the main sanctuary. Bishop Lambert will share a compelling word for prophetic people during this timely gathering. Come and be encouraged to hear from the heart of God. And on Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m., Pastor Lambert invites all to attend the next Pastor's Equipping Session. This essential time of training will focus on principles that will help us grow in the Lord and discover how we can use our ministry gifts and abilities to serve the body of Christ. Plan now to be in attendance. Again, it's happening on Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. The ladies of Bethel are excited about the upcoming women's retreat at Sandy Cove Retreat Center. There are lots of details to cover as they prepare for their time together. If you're attending the retreat, please meet with the Spa Women's Ministry on Saturday, April 13th at 1.30 p.m. in the main sanctuary. They will address all the specifics concerning the retreat. We look forward to seeing you there. Bethel's Mother's Board is a ministry that seeks to connect and share wisdom with all members of our congregation. As we expand our Mother's Board, we're seeking to add 10 new mothers between the ages of 50 and 60 years of age. To serve in this capacity, you must be born again and be an official member of Bethel with a membership number. 
If you have a heart for providing spiritual support to our membership and you want to learn more about this opportunity, please see Mother Marilyn Wilkinson to receive and fill out a contact information card after service today. Thank you for being prayerful about serving Bethel's membership. Men of Bethel, get ready for the Men's Forum 2024. Adam, where are you? On Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. in the main sanctuary. We'll have a time of worship, encouragement from Pastor Lambert, and feature guest panelists that will discuss the challenges that men face and representing God in their families and their communities. Don't miss out. Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. One Flesh Marriage Enrichment Ministry invites all married couples to join them on Friday, April 19th for Ask Pastor Lambert for Married Couples. Get questions answered and have an engaging time of sharing with Pastor Lambert and other married couples of Bethel. This week, remember to join us for our annual Good Friday service on Friday, March 29th at 1 p.m. with a powerful word shared by Pastor Lambert. Then, our Resurrection Day services take place on Sunday, March 31st at 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. And at 6 p.m., we will have our first Power of God service for 2024. This special service is scheduled for every fifth Sunday evening this year. Come and experience God's power to restore, heal, and deliver. God will continue to move in a mighty way. Be sure to join us. That's all of our announcements for this week, and we pray that you've been blessed by today's worship experience on this Palm Sunday. Be sure to visit BethelDeliverance.org to keep up with all of the events taking place this season. Thank you for your time, and have a blessed week. Amen. Please govern yourselves according to all of the announcements. There is one small correction for those who are in, those ladies who are interested in the mother's board. The cards are actually located in the back at the Welcome Center, so we ask that you fill them out there and place them in the mail slot at the nurse's office, and uh, we'll cover it. So don't see Sister Marilyn or Mother Marilyn. Also, lastly, we want to inform you that you keep the following families in your thoughts and prayers the Harold Heller family, the Collins Kennedy family. And we also uh, remind you of the passing of Mr. or Brother Eugene James Speaks, who is husband and overseer of Arlene Mills Speaks and the father of our member, Ramona Mercer and her, her husband, Brother Lyman, and the cousin of our member, Sister Sean Skinner. That service is taking place here on Wednesday. You can get the church information or get the service information. And we also inform you of the passing of Marjorie Briggs, who is the grandmother of our member, Sister Laura McMillan. And that service is taking place on Saturday, March the 30th at United Missionary Baptist Church. Please contact our church office bereavement coordinator when you need to make us aware of funeral announcements. And I guess you'll approach that a little bit differently after this morning's message. Amen. So if you can make some time to be present to support the families, by all means, do so. Pray, give cards, and all those good things as well. Because we are a church family that we care and miracles still happen. And the miracle will be your presence being there. And let's stand. Let's prepare to be dismissed. Pastor Doug, did you have a quick announcement? Eight seats are only left for the Lancaster Bible College program. Eight seats remain for the Lancaster Bible College program. $5,000 worth of credits for $100. Last day. Last day. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. Father, once again, we are grateful for your preached and taught word. We pray that we would not be forgetful hearers, but that we would be doers of your word. And now, Lord, as we leave this place and not your presence, we ask that you go with us and stand by us until we meet again. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The elders will be down front for prayer, meet and greet. God bless you. We'll see you in service.